Throughout the history of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, there have been numerous diverse formats featuring a wide array of competitive decks, from Cookie Cutter Chaos in the early 2000s, to the Whiplash that was Edison format, to the vast game of Pin the Necroz on the Dijin Lock, played by Necroz's numerous challengers, all the way to World Chalice rising above a pack of over 10 distinct topping decks in Europe's second largest YCS of all time. These formats stand out in the common memory of Yu-Gi-Oh! players as some of the most enjoyable for their large number of viable deck types and strategies. Highest among these, however, is the format regarded by many Yu-Gi-Oh! players as the most diverse to ever exist in the competitive game. My name is Avery, and this is a hat format retrospective. Battle Ward is a bunch of <laughs> baloney! That is not true, Squidward. Like this hat, the award is a symbol of... It's a symbol that you're a chump. Ah, oh, no, Squidward. Ah. Oh. And this is a symbol of what I think of the Employee of the Month Award. Oh. An experienced Employee of the Month always keeps a brick of lead in his hat. Hat format was the period of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! lasting from the TCG release of Primal Origin on May 16th, 2014 to the release of Duelist Alliance on August 15th, 2014. Comprising one YCS as well as that year's WCQs and World Championship, Hat itself stands for Hand Artifact Trap Tricks, one of the top decks of the format alongside many others including Gyrgya, Infernity, and Mermail. The format can be divided into two distinct periods, but I will mention all three that Hat was technically a part of. First off, you have Early Hat, from the release of Primal Origin to the release of the Realm of Light Structure deck on June 27th, and then High Hat, from Realm of Light's release to the implementation of the July 2014 Forbidden Limited list on July 14th, and later on, the period of Hat that was played under the new Master Rule 3 from the July Forbidden Limited list to the release of Duelist Alliance. This video, however, will focus on the two former, as that was the biggest chunk of Hat format most people look back on, because once Master Rule 3 and Duelist Alliance dropped, the Hat deck was dropped faster than a pass from the Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback Trevor Lawrence to a clearly open receiver. By the way, Miles Jax wasn't down, don't at me. <laughs> so let's look at the events leading up to hat format that caused the format to develop such unseen levels of deck diversity, as well as the early part of the format under which a single premier event, YCS Philadelphia, was hosted. What was it that led to hat format being so open and diverse in terms of viable decks at both the premier and regional levels? To understand this, we have to go back to October of 2013. In May of 2013, the Dragon Rulers came to the TCG and Lord of the Tachyon Galaxy. You can find that Dragon Ruler retrospective on the channel as well. The deck had dominated the TCG ever since. The September list intended to check Dragon Rulers, but it had only made them more dominant by crippling their main contender spellbooks. The October 2013 list update contained only a single card, the newly released Sixth Sense, which was quickly limited. More important than what it contained, though, was what its schedule signified for Yu-Gi-Oh! The October list was scheduled to last until December 31st, 2013. Starting January 1st, 2014, a new list would go into effect. Lists from January 1st would therefore be implemented every three months. This was a departure from the six-month periods that formats had traditionally lasted since the start of the TCG. This was intended to keep future Dragon Ruler-esque decks from running rampant in the TCG for extended periods. In practice, it meant that formats going forward would be much shorter and have less opportunity to grow stale. The higher frequency of balance would provide constant metagame shakeup. Defiantly, the rulers continued to dominate the TCG for the remainder of 2013, and the limiting of every Dragon Ruler on the January 2014 Forbidden Limited list finally killed the deck as a competitive force. The demise of Dragon Rulers as a deck opened the way for others to compete once more. The first three months of 2014 were essentially a reversion to the Fire Fist Mermel format of early 2013, with a decent competitive presence from Girgia, Infernity, and Bujins, among others. The April 2014 Forbidden Limited list addressed the top two decks with limits to coach Soldier Wolfbark, Rekindling, and Mermel Abyss Gund, leading into a short early April 2014 mini format where no deck established itself as the clear cut best. The release of Dragons of Legend on April 25th drastically warped this proto-format. This booster set introduced a host of new cards to the TCG with dramatic impacts on the metagame. Chief among them were Curry Bandit, Wiretap, Fire and Ice Hand, and especially Soul Charge. Soul Charge would immediately show its power in the TCG as Patrick Hoban piloted a Mythic Ruler deck to win the ARG Circuit Series Richmond on April 27th. The card would go on to be so important and omnipresent in hat format that many players argue to this day that the format should be known as Soul Charge format. The metagame would remain stable for the next three weeks until Primal Origin dropped with a bang on May 16th. 
This was the beginning of hat format proper. Primal Origin was the final booster set of the Zexol era, headlined by cover card number 62, Galaxy Eyes Prime Photon Dragon. Of more interest to competitive players, however, were a few other ultra rares in the set. Sylvan Sage Koya, Sylvan Charity, Madolce Angeli, Artifact Ignition, and especially Artifact Sanctum. Other sought-after cards out of Prio were super rares Artifact Morale Attack, Sylvan Princess Sprout, and Camagorn Anti-Luminescent Knight. There are also the rares, Trap Tricks Diana, and the common Artifact Begal Attack, and the Secret Rare, Aurea, the Sylvan High Arbiter. These cards gave an extra option to the omnipresent Rank 4 Toolbox and offered a strong late game play to the Trap Tricks engine. They also gave the Sylvan and Medolce decks the final pieces they needed to push them into the top tier, and most importantly, brought the Artifact engine to the competitive forefront. Artifact Sanctum would hold a value at a steady $40 plus dollars throughout hat format. The new deck strategies would get their trial by fire immediately. YCS Philadelphia began May 17th, the day after Pryo was released. 1,410 players attended YCS Philadelphia, and Hand Artifact Trap Trick was the hot new item going in. The results reflected a different view of the metagame, though. Hand Artifact Trap Trick variants and hybrids managed to composite 9 spots in Top 32. Girgia, however, accounted for 11 of the Top 32, and Chris LeBlanc's Medolce deck was the overall winner. Hat decks at the time simply did not have a strong Girgia matchup. Girgia Armor was resistant to Hat's main methods of disruption. The hand struggled to produce value against Girgia's heavy back row and floaty monsters, and the less explosive Hat deck lacked an answer to the powerful in phase Girgia gear. Hat decks were also based on underdeveloped theories so soon after the release of Pryo. Girgia, on the other hand, had been solidifying itself as arguably the best deck after the April Forbidden Limited list. That said, the YCS at the time were played with constructed decks only until Top 16. From Top 16 onwards, players drafted decks from Battle Pack 2 War of the Giants. The various World Championship qualifiers would not involve draft in the main events. After Girgia and Hat variants, no other deck at Philly managed to take more than two spots in the Top 32. Madolce, Evil Swarm, Bujin, Mythic Ruler, and Infernity each claimed two spots while only a single Mermel and Zector deck snuck into top 32. Although the deck received a significant boost in Pryo, Sylvans did not live up to the hype of YCS Philly, and the deck failed to score a single top. Early in the format, complicated combo decks struggled to find fertile ground against an underdeveloped metagame. There had been little time to adjust to the significant shakeups brought on by Pryo. The simple back row heavy strategies at Geared and Hat proved more rewarding in an unknown format. However, Hat format had only just begun. Players drew on the lessons of YCS Philadelphia as they looked ahead to the WCQs beginning in late June. The Yu-Gi-Oh! Open in Atlanta the week after the YCS Philadelphia event gave American players a further opportunity to develop and study the new meta. Hat players put in a better showing at this event with five of the top 16 spots going to the deck. Girgia managed only three, and a hat deck piloted by Corey Davis defeated Brandon Wigley's Girgia to take the event. The rest of top 16 was a smattering of Mythic Rulers, Bujins, Infernity, Fire Fist, and even Harpies. Hat decks profited from the fact that most players, after the results of YCS Philly, planned heavily for Girgia. Anti Girgia cards like Mind Crush and Nolman Across Out were in abundance in side decks at the event. There was a lull in competitive play for the rest of May as players prepared for the WCQs next month. Konami did, however, hold three national championships in late May. Hat won two of them in Bolivia and Colombia, and Girgia won the third in the Czech Republic. Fun fact I'm actually part Czechoslovakian. These national championships, along with large numbers of rogue decks, had always been able to compete at the regional level. People were already starting to recognize the sheer openness of hat format. It seemed that literally everything could compete. Decks such as Light Sworn, Scraps, Fire Kings, Ghost Tricks, and Chain Beat, while not necessarily threats at the premier level, were showing that they could snatch top 8 finishes even at sizable regionals. Sylvans finally established themselves as a legitimate contender with a second place finish at the Roanoke, Virginia Regional. The wildly open format continued on into June. There could be no quote-unquote short list of decks that at least manage top 8 finishes in early hat. Decks as diverse as Gladiator Beast, Dark World, and re even Reversal Quiz won or fell just short of winning the various national championships across the TCG regions. Even so, the metagame began to coalesce around an admittedly large group of cream of the crop. The top tier roughly included Girgia, Hat, Infernity, Mermel, Bujim, Madolce, Mythic Ruler, and Sylvans. Fire Fist and Spellbook were arguably contenders as well. These decks were more powerful or more consistent than the rest of the crowd, scoring the majority of tops throughout early hat format and winning most of the large events. 
At ARGCS Washington, D.C. and Milwaukee, these decks took all but two of the top 32 total tops. Try saying tops in total that many times in a single sentence. <laughs> So what led to Early Hat being such a diverse format? Well, literally dozens of decks scored at least a couple top 8 finishes at the sm various smaller events of the format. Even among the recognized meta decks, there were 10 distinct strategies that were considered highly viable. Even amongst comparatively diverse pass formats like Goat Control, Pre-Airblade Turbo, or Edison, nothing even approached the ridiculous levels of diversity in hat format. Gear Gear reigned due to its consistency and strong defensive lineup, but was far from over-centralizing or dominating. The deck was highly beatable due to its slow start and reliance on Gear Gear armor and Gear Gear gear. Hat could, and sometimes did, beat it, but Hat was slow and did not easily gain advantage. Faster decks could quickly outpace it if it did not open sufficient defense. The quote-unquote lesser meta decks of early Hat had their own problems. Infernity, in theory, was not yet adequately adapted to the heavy back row format introduced with Pryo. Mermel was in much the same boat, Bujin was over-reliant on Bujin Yamato, and struggled to exert pressure if Yamato wasn't sticking to the field. Hence why most people of that time called the deck a helmet deck, because you just relied on one card, in this case being Bujin Yamato. Madolche lived and died by its normal summon and was inconsistent in reaching its power plays. Mythic Ruler bricked like Shaq at the free throw line. Sylvans took a ridiculous amount of brain power to play well and had not yet been refined into a consistent competitor. Fire Fist was incomplete as a full deck with Wolf Bark and Brotherhood of the Fire Fist Spirit being limited. Spellbooks lacked a real power play because the telegraphed and easily disrupted world of prophecy build. So many decks were strong enough to compete at a high level, yet each had glaring weaknesses that prevented them from being defined as a clear best. These same weaknesses allowed rogue decks to steal low-level tops with high frequency. This was a culmination of the Zexal era's design philosophy of creating decks at relatively the same power level, with few blowout cards and no all-around powerful decks. It led early hat to levels of diversity that have really been unseen in Yu-Gi-Oh! since. Yet this diversity in its current form was not to last. On June 27, 2014, the day before the European World Championship qualifier was set to begin, a new product was released in the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. The product would turn the power structure of the metagame on its head and usher in the era of hi-hat format. This was Structure Deck, Realm of Light. The release of this structure deck signaled the end of early hat and ushered in the high hat format. Now, before the release of structure deck Realm of Light, Lightsworn was a minor contender in the metagame. Judgment Dragon was a powerful card, but Lightsworn lacked consistency with Charge of the Light Brigade being limited. The release of Curry Bandit and Dragons of Legend helped matters, but was a slow end phase mill like most Lightsworns. However, Realm of Light changed everything. The important new cards in the structure deck were Michael the Arch Lightsworn, Minerva Lightsworn Maiden, and a card that still sees competitive play in 2022, Raiden Hand of the Lightsworn. Now, Michael gave Lightsworn a powerful archetypal synchro, and Minerva saw some play as an archetypal level 3 tuner, but it was Raiden who stole the show. Raiden was a level 4 tuner synergizing well with Lumina Lightsworn Summoner to turbo out Michael or another level 7 synchro, but it was his mill effect that made him so powerful. Raiden could send two cards cards from the deck to grave in the main phase every turn. Previously, Lightsworn had been reliant on either drawing charge or solar recharge to make first turn plays. Without one of the two archetypal spells, the deck was reliant on end phase mills and had to wait until second turn to start its power plays. Raiden, especially in tandem with one of the aforementioned spells, suddenly gave Lightsworn an explosive early game that can overwhelm slower decks before they had a chance to properly set up. Lightsworns could quickly load the grave with cards like Eclipse Wyvern and the Dragon Rulers, setting up for massive plays involving JD or Light Ray Diablos to smash their way to victory. The advent of the Lightsworn Ruler deck had a massive impact on the metagame. Lightsworn largely edged the less consistent, less explosive Mythic Ruler out of the top tier. Girgia, nearly the best deck by top cut representation, suffered from a poor Lightsworn matchup. Girgia armor was easy prey for JD and Diablos, and Girgia's slow roll strategy could be blown out by explosive Lightsworn openings. Hat, on the other hand, benefited significantly. Hat's poor Gear Gear matchup became less relevant with Lightsworn Ruler weakening Gear Gear's hold on the format, and with cards like the Artifacts and Hands, Hat could effectively hamstring Lightsworn's huge plays and grind the Lightsworn deck out. These effects were on display at the European WCQ, occurring one day after the release of Realm of Light. Gear Gear retained its top spot at the European WCQ, with 13 of the 64 top cut slots, but three decks captured eight tops apiece. Hat, Lightsworn Ruler, and somewhat surprisingly, Mermel. 
Now the Mermel deck had adapted by now to the slower back row dominated format, brutally grinding through opposing decks to resolve massive soul charges or Mermel Abyss Megalos to establish dominating positions. Mermel would end up winning the event as Yugen Height vanquished Marcel Burns Lightsworn Rulers in the finals to be crowned European Champion. Now the rest of the format's high tier decks game between three to four tops for the most part, four each for Spellbook, Bujin, and the Fading Myth ruler deck and then three apiece for medolce sylvan and a fire fist artifact hybrid deck that was gaining in popularity and a solitary top for poor infirmities which at this point was considered to be falling out of the metagame the rest of the top 64 was rounded out by solitary wad and chain burn decks because burn always has to be present in some way shape or form in our world <laughs> alongside three evil swarm decks built to take advantage of light sworn rulers newfound popularity following the eu wcq the july 2014 ban list was announced on july 3rd about a week before the na wcq now the july list was scheduled to go into effect the day after the north american wcq coinciding with the release of superstarter space time showdown and the advent of master rule 3. Only one card of note was hit with Gear Geek Gear going to one. Some minor adjustments of potential metagame relevance were Goyo Guardians unbanning, Reinforcing of the Army going to two, and Mirror Force and Dimensional Prison being unlimited. The post list format was thus expected to be much the same as the previous format, with Konami only minorly addressing Gear Gear. In the meantime, North American players prepared for the upcoming NAWCQ. Because with the results of the EU WCQ to go off of, North American players had some context for their deck choices. Sylvans, despite flopping early in the format of YCS Philly, were seen as a major contender by this point. Players like Patrick Hoban and Johnny Lee discovered that Sylvan had an incredible Light Sworn Ruler matchup. Hat was also losing popularity somewhat as players began to discard the hands from their builds. The hands were just too reactive, promoting an overly passive style of play. Many players began to experiment with other more aggressive options, such as Fire Fist Engines or Curry Bandit, which is where we get the names of Fire Fist Artifact Trap Trick, otherwise known as Fat, or Curry Bandit Artifact Trap Trick, known as Cat with a K. Other control decks were starting to fade slightly as players recognized the potential of combo. The massive ceilings of Infernity or Mermail translate to much stronger boards than decks like Bujin could establish. That being said, Girgia remained the most popular deck going into the event. Despite Lightshorn's new popularity, Girgia had a stronger matchup against the rest of the field than any other deck. The opinions of the player base reflected Girgia's perceived strength as many duelists at the NAWCQ expected Girgia to take the event. Hat format had already gained a reputation amongst the community for its incredible diversity, and the NAWCQ was no different. Girgia, as expected, took the majority of the top 64 spots with 13 Girgia pilots topping. Had, as had been standard throughout the format, followed with nine. However, several duels had found success with the strategy of cutting the hands. Five Fire Fist Artifact Trap Trick decks made top cut, as did two Running Curry Bandit instead of the hands. Combo decks did indeed largely muscle out non Gear Gear Hat variant control decks. Lightsworn Ruler took six top cut spots, while Mermel and Sylvan, feasting on Lightsworn's newfound popularity, each grabbed five top spots with their strong Lightsworn Ruler matchup. Infernity finally lived up to its hype and took three top spots, including. Sahabi Karadini's qualification for Worlds. Medolce and Bujin also performed decently, each managing four spots despite pursuing slower strategies than pure combo. Mythic Ruler and Spellbooks, however, flopped very badly. Mythic Ruler being largely inferior to Light Sworn only scored two spots. Spellbooks' inconsistency and low power left it largely unable to stand up to combo, and only one Spellbook Duelist made top 64. The remainder of the top cut slots were a smattering of Heretics, Dark Worlds, Evil Swarm, and Pasquale Croatia's Too Cute, Too Furious Frog OTK deck. Despite the hype around combo, especially after Mermel's victory at the EU WCQ, it would be Control that took the crown. Nothing signified this better than reigning North American champion Patrick Hoban's Sylvans falling to hat in top 16. Furthermore, although hands were losing popularity in artifact trap trick builds, a hat deck nevertheless won it all. Corey McDuffie, a Magic the Gathering pro with no prior Yu-Gi-Oh accolades, piloted a hat deck built purely on theory to become the North American champion. Hi-Hat format drew to a close with the Institution of Master Rule 3 and the July 2014 ban list. And overnight, 
Yu-Gi-Oh! changed drastically, to which many people would say changed drastically forever. Gone were strategies such as field spell wars, changing forever the usage of cards like the Grand Spellbook Tower. Gone too was the first turn draw. This change severely weakened decks like Sylvan, which had been heavily reliant on a sixth card to kickstart their combos. Every deck, however, suffered from losing their instant plus one. Girgia, although still with potential, had to adjust to losing multiple copies of its blowout card, Girgia Gear. And at that point, Pendulum Summoning was also now a part of the game. I hope you guys enjoyed this retrospective. If you did, be sure to give it a like rating, share it around. It was really at this point that Yu-Gi-Oh! changed forever because we got Pendulum Summoning and then we got Cleeforts. Then we got the Pepe deck, which was tier zero. Um, yeah, just the game took off like wildfire at this point. So let me know in the comments what you want me to cover next. Do you want me to continue with what was going to be happening in the next format with Clee Ford and eventually Pepe? Or do you want me to cover even like 2002, Yu-Gi-Oh's first format that was just the starter decks and the Legend of Blue Eyes set? Let me know all of that and more down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.